42 courses. Uh, delighted to have as our guest today, Mark Bowden, who I will properly introduce to you in a minute. But first of all, what I'd love to ask all of you to do is, if you have the camera width, please put on your camera. It's great for us to see the faces of everybody who's joined us. And also, I'm going to ask you to do two things for me today, which is to obviously pay great attention to everything we're going to hear from Mark today. And maybe you could post on LinkedIn with two things. Number one, your biggest takeaway from our conversation today, what you learned, and then tag us at 42 Courses. And what we will do is by two o'clock tomorrow, you've tagged us, we will have seen your post. By two o'clock tomorrow, uh, all of the posts will be in at 4.30. We will choose one of you and we will be giving one of you free access to our brand new course that we've created at 42 Courses with Mark Bowden, Body Language for Business. So one of you will be luckily uh, they're receiving free access to the course. So without more ado, delighted to introduce Mark Bowden, body language expert, best-selling author of four books, co-founder of Truth Plane. Mark is a global authority on nonverbal communication. He's been voted number one body language professional in the world for three years. He trains groups, individuals, how to use their body language and stand out and win trust. He's a TED speaker. Is there anything you cannot do, Mark? Uh, well, he's also on the behaviour panel. So I'm going to hand over to Mark. I'm filling in all the gaps, but I'd love Mark to introduce himself and also to lead in and tell us how he got into this fascinating subject. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, look, all of you probably know something about me, but here's the usual the usual spiel, Mark Bowden, expert in human behavior and body language, and I help people all over the world to stand out, to win trust, to gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. I've written four books on human behavior and body language. And look, all I ever really try and do is help people with their communication. You know, when I was a little kid, I used to be fascinated with biology and the movement of animals, especially uh, aquatic life, especially sea creatures. I was a big fan of Jacques Cousteau. I always used to imagine myself, you know, being underwater with those sea creatures. I loved how they move. I was so obsessed with Jacques Cousteau. This year, I even went and bought the watch, the, the, the Omega Plo Prof that he made, in my mind, so, so famous. So obsessed with... Um, animal biology and movement and, and how that works and how, uh, you know, organisms communicate to each other through space, through movement. I went on to study fine art and especially performing arts. So that's, you know, how we move as human beings, how we behave as human beings in order to communicate in an artistic way. Art for me is just something that reminds you that you're alive. So I was obsessed with what is it about our human body that reminds us that we're alive every day and reminds us that we're with other people and how does that physical communication work and how can we use that to our best ability? What is it that we can do with our body that means we can better interact with other human beings, get more of what they want, get more of what we want, and essentially live better lives together because we understand human behavior better. So look, that's, that's my obsession. I, I truly hope you have questions for me today because obviously I could rant and rant and rant off my own back on this, but more interesting for me is to answer your burning questions right now, because uh, listen, as I've said before on LinkedIn, I rarely, rarely do this. Uh, this is probably only the second or third time uh, I have ever done a live Q and A uh, with a with an audience. Uh, you know, virtually. Um, Obviously, I do show up to to events and clients <laughs> pay me to be there and answer people's questions, but but not everybody gets to come in. And so you're here right now. So I would love your thoughts, your questions. So, Louise, why don't you um, 
let in anybody who has a, a, a burning question or, or if you want to put your questions in the chat, that would be great uh, as well. Louise, I'm going to pass over to you so you can pull in these questions. Lovely. Thank you so much, Mark. Thanks for that lovely introduction. And I cannot tell you all, I have hosted over 100 of these events in various places, and it's quite nerve wracking hosting an event with somebody who is a body language expert. I'm feeling very, very self-conscious of everything that I do. So before we go over to your questions, which as I said, as Mark says, please put your questions in the chat. We can bring you in to put them to Mark yourself. Just as we um, started chatting before this event started, Mark, you commented on my background. Mm. And so maybe we'll kick off with that. Obviously, all of us are communicating with everybody virtually now it's the normal way to communicate but some of us do it a bit better than others and I know one of the subjects that you particularly talk about is deciding what sort of uh, impression you want to give with your background so why don't you kick off with a few tips about that particular subject yeah so let me tell you how important backgrounds are when your brain um, judges people. It not only judges their nonverbal communication in terms of what gestures they're making, what's happening in their face, uh, what they're doing in the space, how much space they're using up, but it judges them based on where they are, the context that they're in. If that human being is contextless, just say they're kind of floating in white space, you know, there's no context around them, that gives less information to the brain to judge somebody by. And when insufficient data, we default to negatives. If I don't know your context, I am not an optimist about it. Now, I know there's outliers to that. You might go, hey, I'm, I'm a real optimist about people. I, I don't judge them. Well, you just judged yourself about not judging other people. We, we live and die by our judgments systems. OK, if there's insufficient data, we default to negatives. So I'm a proponent of putting information into the background because otherwise people are more likely to default to their own negative ideas about you, you know, what's Mark hiding? We can't see what's in the background. What's really going on there, okay? So now the question becomes, what do you want to place in the background in order to influence and persuade people's judgment? So look, if we look at Louise's background there, instantly we see uh, a, ma a map of the world and we've got uh, South America and North America uh, up there uh, from, from my understanding. Um, and so instantly, here's what my brain starts to do is go, oh, so Louise has an idea of, of different lands. She's maybe traveled. Um, uh, maybe, uh, you know, those particular parts of the world are, are important to her. I've, I've even forgotten that the rest of the map is probably there. <laughs> I kind of think that, that she's chosen that area to show me. I start to make assumptions. Now, those assumptions are either accurate or inaccurate or something in between, but I will make assumptions and I will judge. So am I now judging in a way that plays into the image and the idea that Louise wants to project about herself, or is it not what she wants to project? Look, there's no bad behavior. There's no bad body language. There's just results that you wanted or didn't want. There's nothing you can do bad with your body language. There's just results that you wanted or didn't want. That's all. There's behavior. And then the behavior will get you within a context results that you wanted or didn't want. And, and if you're getting results that you don't want, change your behavior or change the context of that behavior or change the audience of that behavior. But something will have to change but but don't go oh you know i was doing that badly so look the key is is what can you put in that background that you think will most likely trigger the people you want to trigger with the idea about you or or your content that you want them to have don't don't do anything by accident nothing in this background is an accident it's all there for a reason yeah, and we can always curate, curate that background in some way. You know, let me just answer one last question that was the, there up the front, which was somebody was saying, hey, I like the late night DJ talk voice that you have. You know, when I first started doing, I, by the way, some of my early work was in 
radio. I was a radio voiceover uh, artist for, for, for quite a while. Uh, one of the things, one of the many things that I that I used to do. And um, what you know, when you're when you're here talking into the darkness, in a sense, it's rather like talk talk radio, where you're on at three o'clock in the morning, nobody's really listening, you can't see anybody there, and you have to keep the content going and keep the content vibrant. I even have here one of the mics that they would use in a radio station, the RE, uh, RE20, I think it is, the Electro Voice RE20. It's the same uh, mic that Fraser Crane uses. Uh, so it's, it's, that, it's that classic um, radio uh, voiceover mic. I've even got an old compressor, and which is, you know, does stuff to the sound, and an old preamp as well that gives it that kind of radio voice. Because I know your brain, when it hears that type of voice, it feels there's something of authority there. Look, there's what I say, and then there's how it comes across to you, and the idea you create about what I say. And the nonverbal information that I put around this helps your idea about what I'm saying. Hope that makes sense uh, to everybody. Uh, Louise, let's have some more questions that are coming Fantastic. in. Fantastic. Now, there's loads of questions coming in. I am going to bring you all in. I'm just going to put one more question myself. Yeah. Now, we're all seated now, Mark. Yes. Uh, but many of us have either been in the office through all of this or are going back to office, transitioning. I know that you give advice in terms of actually the, the seated presentation or the standing and then being aware of the height of your chair. Maybe you mm -hmm. just give us a few tips there coming into a room and deciding, am I going to sit? Am I going to adjust my chair? Am I going to am I going to walk around? You know, everybody has what they think is the thing that's going to put their audience at ease. But what are your sort of top tips for that environment? Okay, so here's some of the stuff you want to be thinking about. And there's a, there's a lot there that I could talk about. First of all, let's think about if you're seated and I decide to stand and we're in the same room together, depending on my proximity to you, I will probably have height dominance over you. And height dominance over you will look rather like like <laughs> this. Okay, same person, same expert in my area, but now I have height dominance over you. In fact, let me come back a little bit here. I'll raise my voice a little bit, but now you can see that I have height dominance over you. Uh, it's very different from if I sit down with you here and now I'm on the same level as you. I could even give you some height dominance over me as well. I can change your idea of the power relationship based on do I get do I have height dominance or not? So you want to pay attention to that. There's also how much space do I own? Do I take up? Am I coming into your space? So if I sit down in the room with you, probably one of the things that I might like to do if I need you to trust me is to make sure that you can see more of my body. So I will actually pull myself back from the table. Usually about a hand span will do it from the edge of the table. Let me kind of mock that up for you now. And now as my hands gesture with open palm gestures at exactly navel height, in what I call the truth plane, now you can see those gestures. So do you feel more comfortable with me now? Imagine you're in the room with me. Now imagine you're in the room with me, face to face, and now you can't see my gestures and the rest of my body. I'm getting strong eye contact with you, but you can't see my gestures. Do you think you feel more comfortable when insufficient data you default to negatives? This is more sufficient data about do I have tools in my hands? Will they be a benefit to you? Could they harm you? Can you see their movement? Can you see their rhythm? So I'm always looking, whether I'm standing or sitting, to make sure that you are as comfortable as possible, unless I wanna make you uncomfortable. Then if I wanna make you uncomfortable for whatever reason, well, I do a whole bunch of other behaviors. I mean, one that I might do that you probably don't want to do, but people do it often by accident, is encroach on somebody else's territory. Very easy in, in a modern world to understand what somebody else thinks their territory is, because just look where their mobile phone is. Just look where they've placed their mobile phone or their water bottle. 
within that area is their territory. If you want to annoy them, start gesturing and start gesturing over their mobile phone. If you want to really annoy them, tap with loudly close to their mobile phone. Yeah, you'll start to see some of them might grab their phone and bring it further into their territory and protect it more. Some of you, them, you might start to see the top lip tighteners. They show anger because they don't want you in that territory. Now, look, I don't know why you'd want to ever do that, okay? But you wouldn't want to do that by accident. And continually, I see people do that by accident. You know, they get excited. They get excited by their pitch, by their idea. They start gesturing out. They're moving into other people's territory, and they can't quite work out why did I get such a bad result of that communication? Why did they ask me such aggressive questions? It's because you accidentally were being territorially aggressive. So the things you want to look at is, are you being height dominant or are you on the level with them? Are you taking up space to show that you have power and authority? Okay. But are you now taking up too much space and being territorially aggressive? Look, Louise, there's lots that we could talk about there, but let's uh, let's move on to some other other questions so everybody gets a, a bit of a chance. Brilliant advice. It's fantastic. I hope you're all crazy taking notes there. Uh, we are recording this. We'll share the recording. So there's a question that's come in from Marjorie, Marjorie Music. Uh, hi there, Marjorie. Uh, if you'd like to unmute yourself, Marjorie, you can put the question to mark yourself. It's very interesting um, about being in long Zoom meetings. Uh, yeah, Marjorie, unmute if you will, and uh, let me have your question. Let's bring Marjorie. Hi, Mark. Hey there. Hi, Louise. Nice to meet you both. See you. Hi, Marjorie. Um, Do go ahead. My question is about long Zoom meetings. I am in meetings a lot for work, and people will talk on and on and I don't know how to make it look like I'm listening and interested for 45 minutes or an hour on a Zoom call. So I was just asking for suggestions about how to look like I'm paying attention and hearing what they're saying. Great, yeah, so, great so question, one of the, Marjorie. One of the things that you can do, Marjorie, is, is show your use of tools because the use of tools shows an engagement of the neocortex, the smart brain. We have, we have a really smart brain. There's nothing on the planet that has as large a neocortex compared to our body, la uh, body mass as us human beings. I mean, whales have large brains, much bigger brain than us, but it's, a whale is trying to move a whole bunch of muscle fibers, literally tons of muscle fibers. It doesn't have a super, super intelligent brain like ours, and therefore, the whale is never going to use a pen. I know it doesn't have hands. And one of the reasons why it doesn't have a super big brain is it's never going to play Chopin as well. You know, even a monkey, never going to play Chopin. Doesn't have, doesn't have the, the neocortex motor cortex to our level that can move the fingers in any way that could ever play the piano. So the moment we start picking up tools and using tools, it tells another human being that there is some neocortex engagement, there is intelligent engagement. Now, one of the things I can then do is show you that I'm taking notes, okay? Now, I just, I just kind of unconsciously show you these things, and then I might put my head down. Now your brain knows that I'm writing. Now, am I writing or am I not writing? Well, you're never gonna know, okay? You're never gonna know, but I'm now gonna look like I'm engaged. now. People might go, hang on, Mark, that's a bit unfair, though, because surely you're being a bit inauthentic and trying to con people that uh, that you're engaged when you're not. Look, some meetings are not very good. Some meetings are not very engaging. Some meetings you're showing up to and going, I have no idea why I'm here, <laughs> but I think my pay packet, you know, or my contract relies on me looking like I'm paying attention. OK, so there's all kinds of reasons for your benefit and other people's benefit that you would do inauthentic behaviors. And here's the other important thing. If you take a few notes, just a few notes, you might even trick yourself into being engaged. You might trick yourself into being engaged so well that you actually find that you actually are engaged. Because the moment you start writing down, 
here's what I think is interesting or important about what was said. Suddenly, information does become interesting and it does become important. So, you know, long answer there, uh, Marjorie, but essentially use tools, if only to then get your head down and do something else that you think is more important, but, but, but keep people feeling that you're engaged in some way. You may even end up actually really engaged and surprisingly engaged. Hope that answers your question uh, well enough there, Marjorie. Thank you so Thank much, Marjorie. That turned out to really be a super question. So now I can see another question that has come up from Andrew. I did see Andrew here, Andrew K. Yeah. Uh, would you like to put the question yourself, Andrew, and join us? Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for asking for my question. Um, yeah. uh, hi, Mark. Um, I spend a lot of time working with people, um, delivering workshops face to face. Yeah. And I can get a little bit um, overly concerned with a fleeting glimpse across a face or a, a, a change in posture. That, and I'm, I'm, I'm prone to pick, picking up micro gestures and, and yeah. lots of conclusions from them. Um, how, how important do you think micro gestures are? And if so, as a workshop facilitator, what would you say the top tells are that I maybe should be looking for from a from my audience of either engagement or disengagement? Hopefully not. But there we go. Yeah, 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 totally, totally. Okay, look, here's here's what I would be thinking about: is any time you see any body language, any behaviour, whether it's micro or macro or anything, the first thing you do in your mind is go, "Oh, they're behaving." That's all. Try and stop the judgment of, uh oh, uh oh, I saw them, I saw anger, uh oh, I saw disgust, uh oh, uh oh, it's this. You don't know. You just don't know. What you do know is you have human beings and human beings will behave. So I may have, you know, sometimes I'm speaking to thousands of people and I'll look out. And I'll see all kinds of stuff. I mean, there's so much going on. And I've just got to be going, okay, behavior. It's behavior. It's behavior. And I've got to go, what's my goal here? What is my goal? My goal is to get this information across. Okay. My goal is to help these people. Now, if I see a behavior, if I go, oh, behavior, and it's it's enough to trigger me into going, I would really want to investigate that behavior. I don't want to judge it. I want to go, what is it really? Then I would stop and I go, okay, so I'm just interested. How are we doing at the moment? What do you think? Would you give me your top takeaway so far? Yeah. Okay. What do you think of the, of the, of the stats that I just showed here? Are you for them? Are you against them? Do you believe them? Do you not believe them? Because I want to see what happens in that person's face or what happens in their body language or happens as a group. I want to see how engaged the group are or how engaged or disengaged that individual is. But I want to know more for sure. So I now start an investigation around that. So, you know, the, the short answer to this, Andrew, is, is as somebody who has worked like you has worked really hard to know what you're talking about and know how to best help people to a certain extent i've got to keep on going and be, not be knocked off course by the world's behavior so i've got to stop judging that behavior but if it gets enough then i would want to investigate yeah, I'm still trying to not judge. I'm still trying to investigate to get to the truth of it, to see whether I do need to change the way I'm going or the way I'm thinking or feeling. Andrew, give me some feedback on that. What, what, what do you think of what I've said there? How helpful is that? You're very astute in, in, in picking me as somebody who can be quite judgmental quite quickly, because I'm, I'm pretty quick at picking up on the people that I think are really getting it and those that, that aren't. So that's been a really useful piece of just try and suspend that judgment. You'll know, be curious, not judgmental, the, the Ted Lasso stuff. Yeah. I think, like, the showing interest and what's really going on here and trying to put the um, put the emphasis back on the people that are in the room because it's not just about me, it's about everybody else in there. It's a shared experience, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and trying to get them to, to take some responsibility and accountability for, 
for what's going on. And if it's not working, I can only change it if they tell me that it's not working. And if it is, I can go down the current route down the route that I'm about. So that's that's really useful. And good yeah, I, optic to go on LinkedIn later on, you never know. So, yeah, <laughs> totally, totally. Thank so you look, you know, so I'm much, just Andrew. using body language as a way of engaging more and getting to the truth more. But what do I really want? I want somebody to tell me with their mouth. I want the words. I want the words of I'm bored and the body language of I'm bored. Or I want the words of this is amazing, you know, and the body language of it. I don't just want one of those. I want to use body language as an entry point into a, a bigger, more engaged conversation. Thanks for that question, Andrew. I hope that was useful for everybody else as well. Uh, what else have we got there, Louise? Thanks. So one question that I particularly like is from Jutta. Now, let's see, is Jutta still with us before I <laughs> choose that as a question? Yes, um, I'm here. Jutta, Can you hear me? You are here. Hey, Jutta. Jutta. Let's uh, just find Jutta. And yeah, Jutta's there. question, just, yeah. Jutta, 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 if you would like to put your question to Mark, very interesting, like whether we all have this skill of reading body language. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yeah. I can. You can. Yeah. Excellent. Um, yeah. Hello. Greetings from Finland. Uh, <laughs> uh, Love to Finland. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for um, having me here. Um, yeah. I was wondering, I'm a great fan of yours in uh, uh, the, I'm watching the behavior panel. Fantastic. And uh, I have your mug as well. I, I can see you have one there. Really good. Really good. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm wondering because I'm very interested in uh, body language and uh, detecting all the signals from other people and um, um, I can see that there's some uh, other people who are they're born with the reading skills and they can detect all the subtle little signals and all the little micro expressions and everything. And then there's me who finds it uh, hard. <laughs> so I was wondering if it's possible for everybody to learn or or is it do we just have to accept that some people are better in it? Mm. Look, no, first thing is everything can be learned. Everything can be learned. And even if you think, well, no, I don't think you can learn this or learn that. I refuse to live in that world. I absolutely refuse to live in a world where where there are things that cannot be learned because that limits me and and I will not be limited by other people's ideas of of who I can be and what I can do so number one and, and people can disagree with me uh no no you can't learn to do this I refuse that I absolutely refuse that I'm not even entering into that conversation it's boring it's tedious to live in a world where where things can't be gained and learnt through the work of just investigating and get, you know, whether it's through books, whether it's through videos, however you best take in that information, it is open to you and you can learn. Now, Jutta, there are, there are people where nonverbal information has been more valuable to them. And so they've learnt. They've been around people where nonverbal information was more valuable. And so they picked up on, on that. They've been around mentors and parents and leaders of some sort. You know, it's not that you don't have that ability. There could be some neurology involved. There absolutely could. But we often find the neurology involved in, hey, I don't pick up nonverbal signals very well, is actually that you pick up nonverbal signals extremely well. And therefore, there is an overwhelm. And therefore, you kind of close off to that purposely so that there isn't this overwhelm. So often we think about, you know, the people with the neurology where we say, well, they don't really pick up nonverbal signals very well. It's the exact opposite in, in many, many, many cases. So look, the key for me is what, what does nonverbal information do for you? Does it irritate you? Does it make you very emotional? Does it inform you and help you? Like how, how, how do you respond to that? And do you find that you're closing off to it or you're opening up to it more? And what could you investigate? What education could you get? What training could you get in order to be more comfortable with nonverbal information, to, to accept it even more, or even to be able to what I, I call thin slice it, which is to go, 
what do I really want to pay attention to? What's most useful in any one situation for me to pay attention to so I'm not overwhelmed by it? Often it's not about learning about nonverbal communication. It's about learning the strategies to better take it in and use it. We all have, listen, if you're alive right now, <laughs> you all are, <laughs> right now, if you're alive right now, you are excellent with nonverbal communication, simply because I know you haven't been run over by a vehicle, because you're alive. <laughs> yeah, and, and vehicles move in a nonverbal way. They don't, they don't tell us they're coming at speed. Okay, we, we nonverbally find out they're coming at speed. And we're either optimists or pessimists about that. And we either step back from the curb and not get hit or we misjudge it. We misjudge it for all kinds of reasons. Sometimes our nonverbal skill wasn't that great and we get knocked out of the gene pool because of that. If you are alive today, it's because your ancestors were excellent at nonverbal skills and you have inherited that excellence at nonverbal skill. So keep on, keep on, keep on learning, keep on learning. Thanks. There Thank we you. are, Jutta. You Thank are you. an expert. You just didn't quite know it yet. Thank you so much Thank for you. joining Thanks. us today. Uh, yeah, I'm going to bring Martin. in now um, Ben, who claims ben. to be a bit of a super fan. Brilliant. Uh, so, Ben, if I could ask you to unmute yourself and join us. Yes, You're very sir. You're welcome, Ben. Ben, great to see you. <laughs> oh, good morning, Mr. Bowden. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm really nervous, even over a Zoom call, believe it or not. Right. Um, Take your time, Ben. Don't worry, I, you are with friends. My, my question is, um, I'm kind of new to the whole body language thing. Uh, I've been following you guys on the behavior panel. I got, a, I got a Winning Body Language and Truth and Lies, as well as a few other books from y'all. Uh, my question is, it's easy to do on Zoom, but in person, when you're trying to get used to spotting these behaviors, how much eye contact can you get away with without looking like a complete nut or creeper? Uh, <laughs> you know, without looking like a psychopath, you know, doing a rom romance or mm -hmm. business. Okay, look, you, you've got to mediate between being social and, and investigating people. Okay, if I start to investigate you, Ben, or interrogate you, ultimately, because we haven't made that arrangement, yeah, I'm doing an antisocial behavior, and your brain will pick up on that. Now, if I say, hey, Ben, every time you meet me, what will happen is, is I will be monitoring you, I will be, it's just the way I am, uh, and what I do, I will be monitoring you, I will be investigating you, I will be asking you hard questions to get to the truth of, of who you are and what you're doing. Uh, so if you don't want that, you should not get into an interaction with me. Now, at least we made a social deal. I told you how I'm going to behave. It's now up to you. Do you want to engage with me or not engage with me? But out there in the real social world where we're trying to get on with people, make deals with them, make, make lifelong relationships with them, we didn't make that deal with them up front that I will be monitoring you, okay? So, so now you've got to work out how desperate are you to read people's body language? Like what is, what is up? What is up that means you want to know without saying to them, hey, I want to know what's going on with you right now. I want to know, like, are you telling me the truth or are you lying to me right now? Like, what, why won't you ask that question? Okay, I, I think whenever, whenever you get in a situation where you're going, will they be able to tell? that I'm checking them out and monitoring them. And it's like, why are you doing that? What's up? What's going on? Like, why? Just be there with them. Just be there with them and see what happens. Okay. And, it, and if you're getting this sense of like, there's a problem here, like there's summing up. Okay. Well, you know, use your skills that you have to try and work out what's going on, but use those skills more towards asking them mm. finding out finding out saying like hey okay how are you feeling right now like like what's going on like tell me that again 
Yeah, tell me that again, because I don't quite understand. I'm worried about what you're saying right now. Be more honest with them, and they may be honest with you. And if you're in a situation where you're going, but I don't think I can be honest with them, well, either that's true or false or something in between, okay? And that could be about your your sense of, of, of risk, yeah? Or just stop being around people like that. It's not helpful. <laughs> stop being around people that you innately feel or co consciously feel cannot be trusted a lot of clients come to me and they go i have a real problem you know talking this pe this person it's like well stop it then don't like don't do it like we can all save i can save time and you'll save so much money <laughs> right now if you could say to me oh you know but they're a real problem in the meeting don't invite them don't invite them. Don't invite thanks, them. To thanks, the Ben. Brilliant, brilliant question. Thank you. So I'm going to come back to everybody's questions in a minute. But from that advice that you've just been giving us, Mark, there's a very fine line, I think, that all of us tread. And it's the JBY, just be yourself. Yes. But at the same time, we want to know that we are learning skills from people and then trying to incorporate them into our own behavior so what's your sort of call on that being natural but still using things like oh should I try this or I don't usually put my hands here but Mark says I should do this and it doesn't feel right so it's, it's yeah. kind of difficult isn't it putting your learnings but looking natural look here's what I'd say about it everybody here today watching this listening to this you are perfectly built for where you are right now <laughs> that's why you are there right now you're, you're sitting there right now, thinking the things that you're doing, living the life that you're living, because you are perfectly built for this. Yeah, uh, but I, I probably won't move from this seat today, and I'll be fine, you know, and, and people say, you know, well, you should go for a walk. And I'll go, yeah, yeah, I, I should, but actually, I'm feeling very, very comfortable where I am right now. And so if, if left to my own devices, I will stay here all day, work it speaking to people like you working on this computer you know and 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 everything will be fine until it's not okay and and when it's not fine or i go i want more or i want less of that that isn't good i don't like that and i want more of this if i don't already have it it's because i'm not doing the behaviors to get it i'm not doing i'm yes being me is great it's got me being me has got me all this okay but when I need different or more or less, I have to think about, do I need to do different or more or less of certain behaviors? I would say as a behaviorist, yeah, you do. Yes, you need to think a different way, but thinking, thinking doesn't win you the game of chess. You have to move the pieces, <laughs> okay? Uh, you, you have to get somebody else to move the pieces for you. Okay, the, it has to, the physical world has to know. As one mentor of mine said, Mark, you have to ask in your out loud voice. They are not mind readers. You've got to ask it in your out loud voice so they're here. And there is risk to that. There is risk to using the out loud voice. And there is risk to people seeing your behaviors because they might say, I don't like it, or you can't have that. Yeah, or you're not good enough. They might have a judgment about you when they see these these behaviors so look you're perfect as you are for where you are right now but have you noticed that some of where you are right now you did make changes you did go you know what i gotta step out of my comfort i've got to step out of what's comfortable for me i've got to almost step out of me yeah into a world of discomfort to move to move to a different place to get something that I want more of or less of or or to help those other people, it's going to be uncomfortable for me. So look, be yourself, you're perfect, unless you're feeling I want more or less or something else or something for somebody else. And then I'd say choose your behaviors to get the results that you want and need around that. Hope that's helpful, Louise. Yeah, fabulous. Now, there have been several comments which have been talking about masculine and female mm. movements i don't know how well you're going to answer this question but i would love to bring in janet if you wouldn't mind joining us janet you've put a very interesting question uh so if you would unmute yourself there and pop your question to uh mark 
Sure. Hey, Janet. Um, hi, Janet. You're very hi, welcome. Um, yeah, this is a little awkward, but I've never seen it addressed before, and I would really like to know what to do. So um, a lot of times when I'm in business, I'm, I'm a more technical person. Yeah. So, so talking technical or talking to even executives, I don't care who they are. I'm engaged in the problem. Right. But a lot of times in conversation circles, either in the hallway or after a meeting, say, um, I'll be in the circle with men and chatting with them. I th and I think everything's going fine, but then some man will step into my space and use the old arm brush. Um, oh, yeah. I, and I don't know how to respond to that. I mean, I, I'm instantly put off. I don't want people copying a feel in public right in front of everybody else. So, but if I, if I do this, I slouch and I look defensive. And if I step away, I get like edged out of the circle. Yeah, yeah. So how do you win the space wars when you've got boobs? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> if, exactly. If you can answer that question, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let me tell you, let me tell you a biological difference between male and, and female, okay? Between males and females is, it, I will win the bet on this, is that uh, if I take 100 males and 100 females, the 100 males okay are more likely to have testes and the and the females are more likely to have ovaries i know that you know i might lose on the individual but on aggregate i'm going to win that bet on male and female not on masculine and feminine okay but on male and female i win that bet because i win that bet i win that bet on who will out of those in that group of 100 who will have as a group the highest levels of testosterone and the highest levels of estrogen if i take one male against one female i may lose the bet but on a hundred males and a hundred females i win the bet that the males have higher levels of testosterone than the females now what does testosterone do i mean it, it'll make the vocal cords more flaccid it'll grow bone structure it'll also reduce for the brain the idea of risk a male is less likely to see risk than a female, not individual, not individual, okay, but as a group. And as a group, if you get males together, the testosterone, which is going to be on aggregate higher, I win the bet in the casino if I swab people's mouths for, who, for where, where the highest amount of testosterone is, that is exchanged in the air, okay? So look, if you, wanna, if you want your team to win, Okay, and you've got a male team or a female team or a mixed team, you find one individual who has high levels of testosterone and you put them in the changing room. Okay, the testosterone gets into the air, other people pick it up and they de-risk. They go, I don't think there's much risk out there in the world. So think about this group of males. Yeah, they think there's less risk. Their idea of space is not necessarily your idea of space or a group of females idea of space when the testosterone low, the testosterone is lower. So how do you play against that? Because there is a, a, a tangible biological difference there, and that makes a tangible difference to how the neurons are working. OK, you, I would say you want to take up more space okay and you want to take up more space with your arms and your hands okay here's how i do it okay if i was standing in that group and i'm talking i'm going to put my hands as i talk into what i call second circle which means no part of my arm is touching another part of my body here's first circle i'm talking to you now and i'm in first circle you can see my elbows have come in this means I don't see risk in the world because I've exposed these vulnerable areas of my body. OK, what I'm going to what I'm going to notice, I might even move forward as I'm talking because I don't see so much risk to taking up people's space. Yeah, I'm going to de-risk it slightly because I'm going to blade in. Yeah, the males are not going to like it if you confront them front of body to front of body. Too much risk now too much risk but if i blade in to the side and i'm using up space here's what's going to happen they're going to start giving me more space yeah now 
I might find that I'm part of that group and people are, there's this kind of dance of space going on. But here's the thing, if everybody is feeling less risk, yeah, I'm not gonna fit in if I'm feeling risk. Now look, there's no bad behavior. There's just results that you wanted or didn't want. That's right. all, yeah, that's all. So I'm not gonna say, hey, they're bad for, for feeling no risk. That's their neurology, that's what testosterone. Listen, my, my son, <laughs> Uh, his levels of testosterone are massive at the moment because he's a teenager. If I had that amount of testosterone, I would be ripping this place apart right now. I wouldn't be able to control myself. Yeah, his levels are so high right now. Okay, that's what it does. It does stuff to people that they cannot control. He doesn't know where the end of his hand is. Okay, he, his brain, his, he, is, he's, he is growing neurons, okay, in his body, as his bones lengthen very, very quickly, he's growing neurons at a, in, his, in his musculature at a faster rate than his brain can, okay? Often because he's not getting enough sleep, okay? So the brain can't grow them really quick. So he has no idea where the end of his hands are. So I can't blame him if I'm going, look, man, you're taking up too much space. Stop knocking over that glass. Stop, you know, it's like, it's like that's the way his neurology is right now anyway look i hope that makes makes sense and i hope that's something you can you can do something oh yeah physically Thanks. it does Thanks thank you so very much, much. janet that was My that pleasure. was great so i know i've personally asked you a question you you wouldn't have known it was from me at the time but it was the conversation about poker players giving away things with their hands and they mm -hmm. don't actually realize and along this line, now, Roberto, are you still with us? I'd love you to ask your question to Mark. Yes, I am. Hi, Roberto, you're very Hi. welcome. Oh, sorry, good to see you. Good to see you as well. Uh, no, I was just wondering, I, I, I hear the term uh, poker face, uh, and I guess that there are people who train themselves because obviously the reward behind is uh, uh, high, uh, so they depend on it. But is there such thing that people can really control? I mean, if it's not the face, it will be any other uh, signal uh, because there will be someone else sitting at the other end that will know how to read the cues from other pocket players, right? Mm -hmm. Thanks, okay. thanks, Roberto. Yeah. Okay. So look. There are, there are some people out there with a very specific neurology that would display something we call flat effect, which is there isn't much happens in the face, okay? That's not because they're emotionless. Often they are actually full of feelings, but have learned that if, they, uh, if those are communicated too much or all at once, the results they get are not good, okay? So they have, they've created a flat effect, nothing happens in the face in order to manage uh, manage that. There's many reasons why that might happen. Uh, there are people who try and create that flat effect, that poker face, because they realize that if they give away too much information, they don't get the result that they're wanting. Now, in both of those cases, unless it's a case of, um, you know, there are, there are some examples of people having, um, uh, different muscula musculature in the face or different uh, neurology in the actual face. That means that some muscles don't move. Uh, all of us have around about 52 muscles in the face, give or take a few, depending on how you want to classify them, and give or take that some of us don't have some of the muscles. There's a lot of muscles there. And it means that, you know, in some people, they don't have all the muscles. Um, so it's not that they don't have the feeling, they don't have the specific muscle in order to, for it to move in order to display that universal feeling. And some people try and learn the flat effect for, for certain results. Now, under stress and pressure though, we can often get those people to break that flat effect in order to, unless the, the neurology is, is there, or unless they have really been, let's just say, punished by the world enough to say, the punishment of me showing this feeling, like you can't punish me, you can't put me under enough stress and pressure that I would never, that I would ever show that, that feeling. Okay, so that may, 
that may happen, okay? That there is, there's, and that, that we might call trauma, okay? That they're, they're traumatized and, and we can't legally traumatize them at any level that they would ever show that feeling. For most others, you can try and create that flat effect, but I can very quickly put you, without you even knowing, under enough stress and pressure that, that you'll start, your poker face will, will drop essentially, if we if we call it that. But when it comes to poker, by the way, here's what I'd say. First of all, work out the math. Like you will, you will lose, you can be the best body language expert in the world, you're still gonna lose. The mathematics win in poker. If you don't know the odds, if you don't know, if you don't know the mathematics of it, you will lose. The body language is only useful once everybody's playing the same level of mathematical game and you know the power of your hand but you don't know the power of their hand statistically yeah or you statistically know yours and you statistically know theirs and now you're looking for the advantage that's where body language comes in that's when it comes in until that point get you like you'll lose if you don't understand your own hand <laughs> so it's the same when you get into a conversation with somebody don't bother reading the body language until you understand the power that you have and the power that they have like why are you even in that conversation what power do you have what power do they have and then once you've worked out that then go so what advantage do i or do i not need in this situation hope that's useful for you lovely thank you so much roberto now, it probably lead, sounds like it might lead on from what you were just saying about having a conversation. Um, Eric Zimmet is with us. Eric, good friend of 42 Courses. I can ask you to unmute yourself, Eric, and join yep. us yeah. to uh, ask your question. Hey, Eric. Hey, how you doing? Good. I had a couple, a couple of questions that I put in the, uh, in the chat. The first one was, sort of already answered a little bit, but I've studied micro expressions a little bit from Paul Ekman. Yeah. I've always been interested in that. Um, how big of a part, again, you already kind of answered this, but do micro expressions play in the whole body language? Is it part of it or is it a whole sort of separate um, area of study? Yeah, look, it's absolutely part of it. Um, uh, you know, I, I would break things into into what the what I would call the gross body is doing, the bigger body. <laughs> Yeah, like, how is it moving in the space? Where is somebody's center of gravity? You know, what are their shoulders doing? Then, then you know, what are their, uh, you know, which, which way are they, are they intending or moving? And then I might think, but I want to know that first of all. First thing I'm looking for is where's your center of gravity? I don't care where your head's turned. Wherever your center of gravity is, yeah, that's where your head's going to end up. Yeah, you may, okay. you may end over here, but if the center of gravity is going that way, you're going that way. Okay, yeah. yeah. But then I want to yeah. go, so I want to go like, how is, the, how is the gross body fitting into the space? Like, how is it? Because it is, we are a result of our environment. You can think what you like, but if the water wants to take you, you're going with the water. Yeah, yeah, you, like, you better be a good swimmer because if the water wants to take you, think what you like, you're going with the water. Yeah, so I want to know what's happening in the environment. What, how, how is, how is the human being dealing with gravity, the center of gravity? Yeah, now I'm going like, what are they doing with their tools? We've got this smart brain here, primarily, first of all, so we can use tools. So what tools do they have? What are they doing with their hands? Whereabouts are those right now? We'll look at that that context and i'll gradually work my way then maybe to going okay so is there something happening fleeting in their in their face that may give me more information but look at it look at it this way eric if i've gone through all of that process the results must be pretty valuable like i'm not going to do this for just for a laugh just because I've got nothing else to do. If I've got nothing else to do that day, I better, I better find something better to do. If I'm doing that with, with there is no valuable result there, but listen, you can do it for your own pleasure. It's like, I love to look at people. I love, like love is a, is a valuable thing. Like I love learning about this. So I love looking at people, love it. Like, great, do that. But, but doing it because, you know, or like, I'm super worried about that person. It's threatening to me. Okay, valuable, valuable. 
but just because you got nothing else to do, like find something <laughs> else to do. In the My wife of... hates it when I do that. When I try to read her face, she hates it. Right. Well, why, I mean, you give me some feedback. Why do you like to read her face? Uh, well, I, I guess it's just uh, familiarity and just being around her more than maybe other people. But uh, so it's a little practice, I guess, other than, you know, his book, Paul Ekman's books and things like yeah. that. I studied the micro expressions, never got outside of that sphere into the body language. I always just kind of stayed in the micro expression space, which yeah, I look, found incredibly interesting. And there's nothing wrong with that, because one of the things we do, I would say that I try to do as, as you know, an expert in in that, you know, so which is just, you know, somebody who's obsessed with it and and has found a way to that it's valuable and valuable to, to other people is I'm, I've got a whole bunch of behaviors that I could choose to look at and elements that I could choose to look at. But what I do is go is narrow it down really quickly. So I might narrow it down to go, you know what, I'm just going to look for micro expressions because that's my mm. best bet right now. That for me is around expertise or, or, or mastery of something is when you, you know a lot but you start to choose as to exactly what you apply and why you apply that. So there's knowing everything and applying everything all at once, disaster, like dog's mm, dinner, yeah, yeah. it's gonna be a mess. So I don't, I don't, I'm not worried if you go, hey, I just wanna concentrate on micro expressions. Great, fantastic, because it's a, it's a great way of purposely narrowing yourself down. No, you'll miss a whole bunch of stuff, but it may not matter. It may not matter. You may get a better result than somebody who was looking at everything because their, their brain was overwhelmed by it. Right. Eric, I hope right. that, that, uh, that answers your question there. Thanks Absolutely. So yeah, that's my biggest question. Appreciate thanks, it. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Well, unfortunately, we're coming to the end of the session. I've never felt an hour ago so quickly. It's been fantastic learning so much from you, Mark. And I hope that everybody who joined us has taken away a good number of tips. So just to remind all of you that uh, we want you to go to LinkedIn. We want you to share your biggest takeaway from this session. Uh, tag us at 42 Courses and some lucky winner will win access to the new course that we have written at 42 Courses, Body Language for Business with Mark. We're very excited. The official launch is next week and you'll get access to that course. Um, and you can find Mark on uh, now. How many different places, Mark? Oh, no, I'm going to say YouTube. You'll, you'll the find me everywhere. Panel, YouTube, the behaviour <laughs> panel. On LinkedIn himself, Mark Bowden. Uh, Twitter, you'll remind us of your handle on Twitter. At Truth Plain. You'll find me Truth by Plain. Look That's it, Truth Plain on Twitter. Truth Twitter. Plain. Yeah. Um, and it's been an absolute honor to be able to pick your brains, especially as you say, this isn't something that you do very often. So we're truly honored to have been able to take these learnings from you today, Mark. So no, I, see thank Chris, you. I see Chris wants to jump in here. So Chris, Chris I will just I was gonna going to say yeah, yeah. I would like to bring Chris in <laughs> just before we wrap up. So, Chris, if you'd like to join us, I'll just spotlight yeah. you. Thanks so so much, Mark. Thank you so much for listening to you. It's like uh, it's like getting sort of uh, a, a shot of happiness and sunshine uh, through the computer screen. So thank you. It's sort of, my pleasure. Whenever whenever I have a chat with you, I always leave a happier, a happier, healthier person. So thanks um, so much for sharing your time. I I just wanted to ask you something that's a bit sort of uh, maybe a bit more lighthearted, which is sort of what what sort of the most memorable body language moment you've ever seen in public or you know whether this is something maybe you've Gosh. you've analyzed on on the behavior panel or, or or just uh you've come across in real life let me tell you this one um <laughs> let me tell you this one because it, it i always remember this because it shows you how vulnerable power is <laughs> is is i was working with um a a Prime Minister who will remain nameless. And uh, I said to this Prime Minister, I said, look, when you're in Parliament, and uh, I want you to, you know, I want you to open up, I want you to gesture really big, really wide, open out your jacket as well. Okay, so we can get so we're getting, you're getting, you know, taking up more space, you know, and, and he had the power, this wasn't somebody trying to be Prime Minister, this is a Prime Minister of a G7 country. And he said to me, 
um, he said, I don't want to do that because they make fun of my weight. They make fun of, of my body. Yeah. And, and he was utterly sincere about it, utterly sincere about it, that he didn't want to, and this is somebody running a country with like, you know, nuclear weapons and stuff. <laughs> okay. And he's worried about, and parliaments, as you well know, are brutal brutal whether you're whether you're male or female especially if you're female they, they are brutal brutal and he said no i don't want to do that and i and i said to him I, I totally understand it i totally understand it parliament is 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 brutal i said but you are you are prime minister yeah and yeah you're a big lad but you're gonna you're gonna let people see that <laughs> he went okay okay and they did <laughs> they did make fun of him i mean they did they did make fun <laughs> they did make fun of him but, you know, it's always stuck in my mind because we are, it doesn't matter where we are, we are all concerned with what this body is doing and what other bodies are doing. And we, and it doesn't matter who you are, you are concerned about how other people judge you. Yeah. And again, I'll just say it again, you know, there's no bad behaviors. There's just results that you wanted or didn't want. And if you're not getting the results that you want, think about what behaviors you could you could use and there's some things you just can't change quick enough <laughs> they're just you and you know you just got to front it out haven't you and walk into the the pressure and walk into the stress of that people will judge you and some of them will be nasty it's just it's just the way it is anyway yeah, we're, hope that we're was all human this. we're all human yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everybody who joined us. And do uh, join us again for another 42 Courses event. And see you all soon. Bye now. Oh, Thank great you. to see you. Thanks for all coming. Fantastic to see you.